Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Welcome to um, the third webinar of uh, the GIWACAF webinar series. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. So thank you for attending this third webinar of the second series of webinars organized by GIWACAF and dedicated to all spill preparedness and response. Um, first of all, I will give some technical details while the participants all um, join. So you have on your screen and um, on your right a chat room where you can ask questions that we will try to answer at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Above where you type your message, you will find documents and PDF presentations that will be uh, available for download at the end of each presentation. If you are having connection internet problems, you can reconnect by clicking on the red button reconnect at the top of your screen. Um, so after a first series of webinars uh, organized last year on the main principle and general framework of OSPIL preparedness and response, um, of which you can find all the videos in replay on our website, uh, this second series will focus on slightly more specific and technical subjects, um, while we hope remaining accessible to a broader audience. Today, the webinar will be slightly longer than the first two ones, uh, if you attended them. Um, it will be a 75 minutes, so one hour and 15 minutes session to cover the topic um, of this person from three different points of view. First, the technical one uh, presented by OSRL, then the industry point of view, and then the government point of view. And there will be polls between the presentations to make it a bit more interactive, at least we hope. Um, for those of you who did not attend previous webinars and who may not be familiar with GI WACAF, I will first give a very brief presentation of the project before introducing today's uh, webinar and speakers. So the GI WACAF project, um, which is the short uh, for Global Initiative for West, Central and Southern Africa, it was established in 2006 as part of a broader joint initiative between um, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, and IPECA, uh, the, oil, the Global Oil and Gas Industry Association for Advancing Environmental and Social Performance. And this uh, broader framework is called the Global Initiative. The aim of this is to promote cooperation between governments and industry in the spirit of the OPRC-90 Convention, so the International Convention on Oil, Spill, on Oil Pollution, Preparedness, Response and Cooperation, um, which is a convention that is key for oil spill preparedness and response and which you have heard um, of if you attended last webinars. And GIWACAF focuses more specifically more specifically on the Atlantic coast of um, Africa, as you can see on the map displayed on the screen. It covers 22 countries from Mauritania to South Africa. Uh, the main objective is to strengthen the capacity of the 22 partner countries to prepare for and respond to oil spills so that they can better protect their marine and coastal environments and communities. To do so, um, we are implementing technical assistance activities, and these range from national or sub-regional workshops, training um, exercises, both tabletop or deployment exercise, and we also organize every two years a biennial conference gathering the 22 countries. Um, on this slide, you can see in a nutshell uh, how and what how JWACAF works and what JWACAF does. Um, you can read this starting from the top and reading it clockwise. Um, so GIWACAF is a joint endeavor between IMO and IPICA, uh, so between the public and the private sectors to manage all spill risks and mitigate associated impacts. It supports 22 African partner countries in the development and implementation of sub-regional and national oil spill preparedness and response systems. And as you will see today, the dispersion policy should be really part of this national um, oil spill preparedness and response system. And GIWACAF maintains a constant liaison with partner countries to provide tailored capacity buildings and solutions, thanks to the network of dedicated governmental focal points, but also experts are the one uh, who will be presenting today. Uh, we organize workshops, training courses and exercise, as I said before, and we encourage better communication and collaboration between governments and industry. And finally, we encourage partner countries to ratify and implement international conventions from IMO um, and other UN bodies. 
So um, building on the first season, uh, which ran from June to December 2020 and covered the main uh, principles and general framework of OSP preparedness and response from different perspectives. Um, this new series of webinar covers more um, specific topics related to OSP pre preparedness and response. Today's webinar is the third webinar uh, in the series and is dedicated to the use of dispersant in case of an oil spill in the marine environment. And you can find our previous webinar in replay um, on our website or YouTube channel. Um, the next one on wildlife response uh, will be um, held mid-July. Today's uh, webinar is uh, objectives are for you to understand the mechanism of dispersion, the necessary conditions and application methods um, to get an overview of the use and limitation of dispersants as one of a range of available options in case of marine oil spill and understand the importance of a clear policy regarding the use of dispersants. Um, to do so, uh, we, are, we have with us today three um, speakers. Um, who will uh, deliver each a 15 minutes presentation followed by quizzes. And at the end of the webinar, there will be a 10 minutes uh, Q&A session. So um, first, Ken Church from OSRL um, will give a presentation on what are persons and how to use them. Then Justina Lee from Shell will give um, examples of the good use of persons as part of an oil spill uh, response from the industry point of view. And then Feroza Albertus uh, from the Department of Environmental Affairs of South Africa will um, present the case study of the South African dispersant policy. You can find more information about Chiawakaf and our activities in the brochure available to download above the chat box and on our website or LinkedIn page. Um, and now I give the floor to Ken Church uh, for the first presentation. Thank you. Hopefully you're seeing my slides. Hi, and uh, welcome to this webinar on dispersants. My name is Ken Church, and I've worked for OSRL for 12 years in my current role. I am one of the OSRL representatives based in Aberdeen, where we support our UK members. I'm also a member of the OSRL Dispersant Core Group. The core groups were set up uh, at OSRL to provide specialist resource that can share experience and provide discipline capability, both internally and to us, to our staff, and externally to our members and wider um, stakeholders. Dispersant is one of several core groups. Before discussing dispersants, I'd like to share with you a video uh, with you that explains a little more about dispersants. While this is on, I'll turn my camera off just to um, share, uh, hopefully prevent some of the buttering, buffering. Dispersants are oil spill treatment products designed for spraying onto oil spills to enhance natural dispersion. Scientific evidence supports their use as being an efficient and effective response technique that can be used independently or in conjunction with other response activities. By dispersing the oil into the water offshore, the impact on shorelines and other sensitive resources may be prevented or reduced. Oil and water do not mix. But natural dispersion and biodegradation of oil by bacteria in water has occurred for millions of years. Dispersants accelerate this natural biodegradation. They have two main components, a surfactant and a solvent. Surfactants, as the name suggests, are surface active agents, 
Part of each surfactant is attracted to oil, while another part is attracted to water. Once attached to each element, the surfactant reduces interfacial tension. In other words, it literally pulls the oil and water apart. The solvent transports and distributes the surfactants into the oil. The better the solvent's penetration, the more efficient the dispersant and its action in tackling the spill. Dispersants have some of the same ingredients as everyday products, such as toothpaste, sunscreen, and cosmetics. However, they are designed to work in the marine environment and prevent oil from re-coalescing. Before a dispersant is approved for use, it will have been tested for efficacy and toxicity. It's also added to a list of approved for use dispersants for the country of application. When dispersant is applied, biodegradation starts almost immediately. Oil droplets of varying sizes disperse into the top 10 meters of the water column. Marine currents then quickly dissipate the oil to very low concentrations over wide areas. Advances in the science of dispersants has made them more effective and suitable for use in more cases. They are less effective against heavy fuel oils and viscous emulsions, and they have varying degrees of effectiveness on all other oils. So which dispersant to apply and how to apply it will depend on the area to be treated and the type of oil involved. If dispersants are to be used, it should be as early in the response as possible. Oil's viscosity and emulsification increase with time in the water, and the window of opportunity to use the dispersant may be missed. When an incident occurs, planners and responders need to make value-based decisions on which response techniques offer the best opportunities to mitigate the impacts of a spill on sensitive resources. Known as Net Environmental Benefit Analysis, or NEVA, this approach is supported by methodologies such as Spill Impact Mitigation Assessment, known as SEMA. This is an objective approach to assessing the impact of an oil spill on a range of environmental and coastal resources. It also helps prioritize the best tools and techniques to mitigate the effects. Aircraft operating over open sea can have vital advantages over surface vessels. These are speed, range, and most importantly, a significant payload in the early stages of a spill, thus making them an efficient and effective way of applying dispersants and treating oil. Light aircraft and helicopter systems are suited to rapid deployment. Carrying smaller dispersant payloads, they are ideal for spot treating patches of oil. At sea, dispersants can be sprayed from a variety of vessel-mounted systems. A uniform spray pattern of droplets is required to minimize losses due to wind drift. Spraying should be targeted on the heaviest oil concentrations to have maximum effect. Oil spills need constant monitoring to assess the effectiveness of the dispersant being applied. Tools such as fluorometers measure the amount of oil that has been dispersed into the water column and can provide evidence of the effectiveness of the dispersant being applied. In certain circumstances, dispersants can also be applied sub-sea. The benefits of this technique include the ability for dispersants to be applied 24 hours a day in most weather conditions. Sub-sea dispersant can be applied at a lower dispersant to oil ratio than surface application. This is because the oil is treated when freshest and at its most concentrated. In almost all cases, regulatory approval for use of dispersants is required. Therefore, using the spill impact mitigation assessment method, the where, when and how to apply dispersants should be agreed during the contingency planning process. These plans should be put in place by companies and local and national authorities. Modern dispersants can tackle oil spills by significantly enhancing the natural process of dispersion at sea, and as a result, 
eliminates or significantly reduces the impact on shorelines and sensitive natural resources. Okay, hopefully you were able to watch that video. I'm trying to click on the slides, but it doesn't seem to be uh, working. It should be working now. Yeah, it is, yeah. Let me just, I've just clicked too far now. Excuse me, I uh, click back. No problem. Okay, so apologies for that little uh, interruption there. As we saw in the video, uh, dispersion is a dispersion is a natural process. The level of natural dispersion will vary greatly depending on the oil type and the environmental conditions such as sea temperature and wave action. The purpose of a chemical dispersion is to enhance that process and get the oil into small droplets in the water column. Once diluting the water column, the droplets can be consumed by microorganisms and removed from the environment. The microorganisms will convert the oil into carbon and water. It is important to note that dispersants are not always suitable for a response strategy. A robust decision-making process, often documented in the contingency plans, must be followed at the strategy planning stage, and this should guide the incident management team towards a suitable response strategy. As we saw in the video, dispersants can be applied in a variety of ways, depending on the scenario and the resources available. Aerial dispersant application is advantageous as it is relatively quick and the larger aircraft can carry a large payload. The disadvantages are that unless you have multiple aircraft, this cannot be on scene for long periods of time. Vessel-based dispersants are often used on scene at the start of an incident on board emergency response and recovery vessel or rescue vessels, uh, but generally not in large volumes. They can be selective on spraying, so are good for small concentrated areas of oil. Vessels are relatively slow, and once empty of dispersant, can take time to resupply. Sea dispersant is generally more efficient than surface dispersant, with a dispersant to oil ratio of between 1 to 50 and 1 to 100. Um, but does take longer to mobilise and can obviously only be used for subsea scenarios. Subsea dispersant, once in place, can continue 24 hours a day whereas other application techniques are limited to daylight hours. Most vessels that are pre-designated pre as dispersant application vessels will have some form of spray arms fitted. These usually fold away or are removed when not in use. The spray nozzle needs to be quite close to the oil water surface so that the dispersant arrives on the surface in suitable sized droplets in suitable concentrations. If the arms are too high, then there is a risk of dispersant blowing away from the target. Ideally, the droplet size should be between 300 and 800 microns. Too large, and there is a risk of dispersant passing through the oil layer, and too small, and it may penetrate or blow away. Uh, it may not penetrate or blow away. In some cases, as in the image on the bottom right, it may not be possible to mount arms at a suitable height. In this case, drop-down nozzles can be attached to ensure the nozzle is at the optimum height. For surface applied dispersants, the planning dispersion, dispersant to oil ratio is usually 1 to 20. This may need adjusting once on scene, depending on the oil weathering and the environmental conditions, but 1 to 20 is a good planning guide. Aerial application can be carried out from a variety of aircraft. Here we have a Boeing 727 aircraft spraying in the top left. Uh, bottom left, we have helicopter uh, spray put in action. These carry smaller volumes of dispersant, but as helicopters are very manoeuvrable, they are good for spot spraying smaller slicks. Bottom right, we have a small aircraft spraying, use for, uh, use for smaller volumes of dispersant, hence smaller spills. Also good for carrying out test sprays of dispersant prior to larger aircraft being tasked. Uh, the top right image demonstrates a spray coming out of an aircraft boom. 
Again, we want to disperse the dispersant to arrive on the oral surface in the right size droplets. So lots of design and testing goes into ensuring the aircraft nozzles deliver an even spray pattern over the swath width with the correct droplet size. Prior to application, dispersant is recommended that it, if uh, is recommended that if possible, a basic field dispersant effectiveness test or shaky bottle test is carried out. This will give an indication as to whether the dispersant is likely to be effective if applied. The test will be carried out in the area that dispersants are potentially going to be used. The test provides a comparison between natural dispersion effects and chemical dispersion effects. Uh, we start with two jars of seawater, three quarters full. We add 20 droplets of oil taken from the sea surface in the area the dispersant operations are planned for to both jars, or we pour enough to cover the surface of the water of the jars to about one millimeter thickness. One of the jars is left like this and is your comparison measure. The other jar also has one drop of dispersant added, usually of the same type that you're planning to spray. Both jars have lid secured and should be shaken lightly 10 times. comparison jar, the one on the right here, will not mix well. All droplets will rise to the surface and leave wa the water fairly clear. If the dispersant is effective, the oil, dispersant and water jar will mix to form a cloudy coffee coloured liquid. The oil will form very small droplets that rise very slowly to the surface. If a marked increase of water cloudiness and less surface oiling is noted, this suggests dispersant use would be effective. If water clarity is similar to the comparison, then this is indicates that dispersant would not be effective. Safety is a priority. These tests should only be carried out if it's safe to do so. Once spraying operations are underway, then monitoring should be carried out to validate this, that the operation is working. The first way we can do this is through visual observations. If during these observations we note that there is no change to the appearance of the oil, then this indicates that, the, that underdosing is occurring or the dispersion is not working for some reason. If we're noting that there is a milky white plume in the water column, then overdosing is occurring or the target has been missed and dispersion is going straight to the water. What we're expecting and hoping to see is the oil turn a coffee colour and start leaving the surface and dispersing into the water column. Depending on the oil type and thickness, this may happen straight away or it may take a few minutes to occur. Some application considerations. Surveillance is recommended to find the thickest part of the slick. This will be where the dispersant will be most effective. A surveillance aircraft can guide the dispersant aircraft or vessel to these thicker parts of the slick. Users must be trained in the safe handling and application of dispersants and given access to safety data sheets and manufacturers recommended a match and manufacturers recommended pre-PE. Logistic planning for the ongoing supply of dispersants during a response needs to be addressed early. The most common cause of spoiled dispersant is deterioration of the containers due to heat, moisture and or harsh UV. Stocks should be stored away from extremes of heat and sunlight and tested periodically. A country approving dispersants should have a recommended retest period. In the UK, that's every five years. Thank okay. you very much. And for um, this presentation and showing the video, now we have a um, small quiz for participants. So I'm displaying it. Um, you can see the quiz uh, in the chat. Uh, in, in, um, in, in a tab above the place where you type in uh, your message in the chat. So the quiz is, what part of the water column do surface uh, dispersants work in? A, top 100 meters, B, top 5 to 10 meters, C, all the way to the sea floor. So I will give a few, um, one minute for all participants to um, answer. So once again, you can find the poll um, in a file above, uh, in a tab above the, um, the place where you type in your message in the chat. I can see results coming now. Uh, so 92% for uh, answer B, 12% for answer C. It changes a bit. 
Um, I think now we have 80% for B18. Um, so Ken, maybe if you uh, want to comment on the yes, answer sorry. and give the answer, yeah. Yes, certainly. Hopefully you saw in the video, it's the top five to 10 meters of the water column. Uh, natural dispersion just takes takes part in that top five to 10 meters. And when we add chemicals, that also just takes part in the top five to 10 meters of water column. What dispersants don't do is they don't sink the oil to the seabed. Uh, they just work out top five to 10 meters, which is why many countries will have a minimum depth uh, of water uh, the dispersant should be applied in. In the UK, it's 20 meters. I know other countries have, have different uh, depths, uh, but it's the top five to 10 meters of the water column. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, now I'm ending uh, the poll for this first question and we have a second question. Um, so the second question will appear at the same place uh, above the chat box. Uh, it is, what visual indication do we have if the dispersant is working? A, a white plume will appear in the water. B, all turns a coffee color and form the plume below the surface. C, all will sink to the seabed. So um, I give a few minutes for the participants to start to answer the question. Um, once again, it is in the tab above where you can type in your uh, message in the chat box. Only one answer is correct. I think now we have Yeah, oh. so um, Ken, if you wish to comment on this. Yeah, nearly everybody's got that one correct. Yeah, we're looking for that uh, to turn the coffee colour and it forms a plume just below the surface and that would happen almost immediately or within a few minutes if it's a, a particularly uh, thicker oil. Uh, but yes, if it's a white plume, we're overdosing uh, or we're missing the target completely. Um, it doesn't sink to the seabed, as I said, it works in that top five to 10 metres of the water column and we're expecting to see that coffee coloured plume. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Noah. I'll end this poll um, and I will give the floor to uh, Justin Ali for the second presentation um, of this webinar. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Hi, all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everyone, for joining me. So um, this is section of the webinar, I am going to be taking a quick look into the different uh, perhaps misconceptions about uh, toxicity and um, a little bit of an introduction as to the best way to plan for using dispersants. Uh, we'll quickly recap on what are bacteria. A quick look at dispersant toxicity testing, um, a little brief look into nebosema of dispersant use and then how that feeds into the proper planning to use dispersants. Okay, so dispersants, as Ken has um, rightly explained to us, uh, break the oil slick up on the surface into tiny, tiny droplets, no uh, uh, bigger than a human hair. So uh, we understand this, we understand that that happens in the top five to 10 meters of the water column, um, but I think we need to take a step back and just uh, ask the question, well, why? Why do we want the big oil slick on top of the water surface to be broken up into tiny droplets in the top five to 10 meters of the water column? And it's all to do with bacteria, specifically oil eating bacteria. So let's just take another step back from that and just understand that across all our oceans in the world, there is a natural amount of oil in the water. Um, in fact, 47% of all oil found in our oceans comes from naturally occurring oil seeps. And um, so Mother Nature, being Mother Nature, has utilised this. And there is a whole army of microorganisms, so bacteria, yeasts and fungi, that use this natu uh, naturally occurring oil as food. So they eat the oil and they can convert it into energy, carbon dioxide and water. 
So there is this baseline level of oil occurring in the ocean and there's the baseline level of bacteria that eats the oil available to us. Now, the most common or well known about oil eating bacteria is the um, Arcanivorix vulcamensum, and you can see it on the bottom left there. And this bacteria is found all over the place. Um, it's found in freshwater. It's found in the Mediterranean, the Pacific, the Arctic. And in 2019, scientists even found quite a large population of oil eating bacteria um, in the Marianas Trent, which is 11,000 meters uh, under sea to sea surface. So you can see the bacteria is present all over the world from the Arctic waters to the more temperate and Mediterranean um, equatorial waters. And it's in our surface waters all the way down to the cold deep. Um, deepest waters that we have. Now, when an oil spill happens, this bacteria is ready to pounce on this sudden increase in its food source. So bacteria can multiply and grow and increase its population really quickly. And that's exactly what happens. So we have an oil spill. We use the dispersants to break up the big oil slick into tiny droplets. And the bacteria thinks, great, more food for me and starts to increase its population. There's more bacteria to eat the oil. And you can see on the right hand of this screen a photo micrograph and that just shows the size difference between an oil droplet so the oil droplet is the bubbly bit and then in the dashed red line there's actually bacteria you might have to squint to see it so you can see that even a small oil droplet is a lot larger than an oil eating bacteria so that's why we need dispersants we need dispersants to break up the oil into the tiniest droplets it can because then it gives the bacteria more surface area to eat the oil and it uh, biodegrades it a lot quicker. So how quickly the bacteria can eat the oil depends on a couple of things, um, namely the chemical compounds of the oil spill itself. So different chemical compounds are a bit easier to digest than others. And also the availability of the oil in the water column. So as, as I've just explained, if the oil is one big thick slick, it's quite hard for the bacteria to eat it because they're so small, but if we can get it into tiny droplets, then there's more surface area for the bacteria to work on and eat the oil, so it'll degrade quite quickly. The most favorable condition um, for um, spraying dispersants and actually for bacteria to eat the oil is, is offshore, where there's plenty of water exchange dilution and there's plenty of bacteria, and um, it just has a feast on the oil that's now in the top ten, five to 10 meters of the water column. And then the bacteria can eat the oil anywhere between one to two days um, and four to six weeks. And normally what we'll see is that uh, the bacteria will really get to work the first couple of days. And by five to six weeks, um, the dispersed oil in the water column is gone and the bacteria have now reduced down to their baseline level um, before the oil spill happened. The ingredients of dispersant. So there's a, a common um, and understandable misconception about the um, different ingredients that are in dispersants. And um, there's a misconception that actually dispersants are full of really nasty chemicals. And when you're spraying dispersants on an oil spill, you're simply adding on more chemicals to chemicals that are already polluting the ocean. Um, that's actually not correct. And there's been a whole world of data and research and literature out there to explain this. So I'm just um, lightly going to touch on this, okay? So you can see on the left side, uh, you've got a list of ingredients that are in Corexit 9500. So Corexit 9500 is a globally recognized and um, approved dispersants that's used by operators, by governments. And um, so it's quite a, a well-known and familiar dispersant that we use. And then interestingly, on the right hand side, you can see uh, examples of the um, ingredients of Corexit 500 and what they're using. So we've got skin cream, we've got shampoo, we've got baby bath and lots of um, kitchen uh, household cleaning products as well. So you can actually see that the chemicals using Corexit 9500 are actually chemicals that are also used in uh, products that we use every day. Now, how this translates to toxicity. So aquatic toxicity is measured in um, lethal concentration 50. So in labs, tests are done to measure how much or 50% um, of a chemical substance will actually kill the test organisms. So these are small fish, shrimps, that sort of stuff. Um, the uh, Mokondo oil spill 
in the states. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, debate about dispersants, um, a lot of public um, outcry. And so the US government actually made a scale, which you can see on the bottom right of the screen, to explain the LC50 um, rankings and the rates. So it's from very highly toxic to practically non-toxic. And just, just to note that for LC50 testing in laboratories, it, um, they don't reflect the real world in the sense that the test bottles or containers that they're using are closed environments. So they don't have the water exchange and dilution that happens when you're operating in the ocean. Um, so often the test results for LC50 are a lot higher, a lot more severe than they uh, would be in if, we were, if it was happening in the oceans. So this is the toxicity scales that the US government um, developed. And you can see here, interestingly, on the left-hand side, that um, Louisiana sweet crude oil is in itself um, moderately toxic to shrimp and small fish. Now, Corexit 9500 is slightly or practically non-toxic to the same organisms. Um, and when combined, so sweet crude oil with Corexit 9500, the resulting mixture is actually less toxic than the oil itself. So just take a moment there. So when you spray dispersant onto the oil slick, it actually makes it less toxic to aquatic organisms than just having the oil there. And then if you look across to the right, you'll see that Corexit 9500 compared to uh, dish soap, baby shampoo is also actually less toxic. So again, there's, there's a little bit of um, misconception, misunderstanding about dispersant toxicity and uh, LC50, aquatic toxicity is itself a minefield and it's a challenging subject, but um, it's the toxicity is not as uh, severe or is insignificant as perhaps misunderstood. So the Neva SEMA of dispersants, so you can see on the screen here, there's um, definition of net environmental benefit analysis and spill impact mitigation assessment. And basically this is just the process that the um, response industry operators, governments, um, anyone involved in spill response from incident will use to make sure that the decisions and the way that we're driving the response forward um, is working in favour of minimising harm to the environment or indeed protecting the environment. And it's all about trade-offs basically. So spill response, we say we have a toolkit um, available to us. So we have several different response strategies that we could use and not every response strategy is um, perfect and not every response strategy can be used in every spill situation. Uh, the important thing is, is that we have this toolkit, this toolbox available to us. And so when the, in the response is evolving, um, discussions and decisions will be made about which response strategy would be best to use in this specific situation compared to others. And it's also important to know that actually you might start off using dispersants, but that might only be effective for a part of the response. And then you might have to go on to using other different response strategies. One of the main positives of using dispersants is that it removes the, the big oil slick on the water surface and temporarily disperses it into the top five to 10 meters of the water column allowing the bacteria to eat oil. So uh, it says a wealth of data available, um, which shows that uh, the recovery time of uh, zooplankton and algae and bacteria and all the uh, uh, organisms that live in the five to 10 top meters of the water column recover a lot quicker to a temporary increase in dispersed oil than larger animals such as birds and sea mammals and, uh, and any more animals and wildlife that we find on our shoreline. And in general, most of our sensitive habitats tend to be on the shore. So by dispersants removing the oil from the water surface, it's removing the risk that this big, thick oil slick is gonna hit the shoreline and then negatively impact our sensitive shoreline habitats and any supporting flora and fauna that it supports. Um, and the, obviously the, the drawback is that there will be this temporary increase in dispersed oil in the water column. But like I said, the organisms that live in the water column do bounce back a, a, a lot quicker than the other ones. 
Um, dispersants, like I said, might be used uh, for the first part of the response, and we might have to um, use another response strategy uh, later. There is a window of opportunity to use dispersants, which is why it's really important that we plan to properly use dispersants so we can make the necessary calls, get the necessary approval, and start using dispersants as quickly as possible so we don't miss this window of opportunity. There are um, definitely some situations where you wouldn't use dispersants or where at least there'd be more discussion about nevocema and special consideration would have to be um, given. And that is primarily um, in uh, areas of shallow water depth. So like uh, Ken said, so normally dispersants is not normally allowed in water depths of less than 20 or 10 metres. And this is because there's just insufficient water volume to allow for um, adequate enough water exchange and dilution. And so the, the types of habitats we tend to get in these shallow waters tend to be wetlands, tend to be mangroves, tend to be um, uh, harbours, estuaries, mud flats, uh, coral reefs. And you can see on the screen a couple of pictures of these habitats. Um, often, mangroves and wetlands they tend to support quite diverse um, uh, juvenile and nursing um, uh, populations so um, and it's in these life stages that actually the animals in those habitats tend to be more sensitive to um, uh, diluted oil in the water column so so we don't we don't spray dispersants there because we don't want to push the oil into the water column there might be um, a discussion had if that's actually considered that perhaps uh, dispersant spraying nearer to these habitats is actually going to be more beneficial than leaving the oil on the water surface. Um, but this, would, this discussion would be had with the regulators and uh, all the necessary parties. So just to recap, dispersants are part of the response toolkit that we have available. Um, you can see here uh, the effectiveness of different response strategies. And uh, you can see that dispersants actually have quite a large sort of span of effectiveness. And they do tend to cover um, the largest uh, range of environments in the sense of the largest range of uh, wind speeds and wave heights. Um, but again, it's a toolkit, it's a response toolkit. So where you might use dispersants to start with, you might end up using something else um, later, or equally you might be running uh, different response strategies alongside. So it's just about having this response toolkit, but dispersants do make up a really valuable part of that. So we want to use dispersants and we want to use them quickly, so therefore we need to plan to use them. Um, before we even start thinking about dispersant spraying, we need to answer a couple of questions. And there you can see on the screen, there's just uh, an example of the questions that we need to consider. Um, first of all, we need to just actually make sure that the dispersant um, is going to work on the oil that's spilt. So Ken explained just the shaky, the shaky test. Um, once we know that that uh, is possible, we'll then consider the nevocema and actually is spraying dispersant and transferring the oil from the surface into the top five to 10 meters of the water column for the bacteria to eat it. Is that what we actually want to do? We need to consider the sensitivities in and around the spill site. Um, and then we need to get regulator approval. So we can't spray dispersants without regulators and their advisors agreeing to it. Now, different countries, different regulators have different ways of approving dispersants. Um, Normally, these are done by uh, a dispersant product approval list. So um, different national contingency plans might have a list um, which just says you can use this uh, dispersant types A, B and C. And so those are the only types of dispersant you can use because enough data has been presented to justify why it's the best dispersant to use. Or perhaps um, the regulators might have um, authorised uh, zones of use. So they're saying that dispersants can be sprayed in this area, but not in this area because it's closer to the shore or, or shallower water depths. And often this information is contained in the national contingency plan of that country itself or in a standalone dispersant policy. And I just grabbed this from the GI WACAF website. And you can see actually that the majority of members either have a national contingency plan with dispersant policy involved in it or at a standalone dispersant policy, which is excellent. So the pre-authorised use of dispersants, just a couple of case studies for you here. Um, Ken's, like Ken said, uh, the UK, the um, 
uh, dispersant is the primary response strategy. So um, we still have to have some sort of regulator approval, but we can start spraying uh, a small amount of dispersant straight away. Um, in the USA, dispersants have been discussed there for decades. And so what the government has allowed is there's pre-authorized zones of dispersant use in every state, including Alaska. And then what this means is that the, um, the command of the response can actually spray a certain amount of dispersant without actually having to ask the federal government permission more to spray uh, if if more dispersant needs to be sprayed or indeed they need to spray dispersant out of this pre-authorized zone then these discussions with the regulators happen and then in the middle east uh, there's quite clear dispersant uh, guidelines and considerations that we need to take so all the major uh, countries of the middle east have got this regional dispersant um, guide and it has a list of all the approved dispersants that can be used and very clear instructions and guidelines of when you can spray dispersant and when not to spray dispersants as well so the good practice of dispersant and technical guidance on using dispersants and um, nebosemas and all, all this good material is available um, in, um, we can go uh, IPICA website, um, I've got API guidelines and it's, it's all there. It's actually also um, on the webinar jam so you can download the documents if you'd like to. And there is a wealth of information out there. Um, dispersants have been around for a long time and dispersants study into it has also been around for a long time. Um, and if you want any more information about anything I've been discussing, then please feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, the problem is, is that although we have all this wonderful information out there, uh, it's uh, perhaps not getting out as well as we'd like. So uh, since 2015, I think, I might be wrong on that day, IPICA have responded to a number of um, uh, oil spills worldwide. And um, uh, 10 or so of them haven't, uh, have involved dispersant usage and perhaps it's not been the correct use of dispersant um, and it's just sort of shown to industry that well actually this information that we have although is really helpful is not getting to the people that are spraying dispersant and it's not necessarily then in the format that makes uh, for, to, to allow us to understand because it's a relatively technical topic especially when you start talking about LC50 and aquatic toxicity. So a new cohort has been formed under IPICA and one of the aims of this cohort is to take all this technical scientific information and put it into simple terms that we can all understand, which will uh, help us understand dispersants and its proper use and help us to plan for it more effectively, but um, also avoid the misuse of dispersants, which is no good to anyone. And that is all. So uh, we have a quiz. Thank you very much, Justina, for this very interesting and clear presentation. Uh, so now we have a quiz. So I will display um, the quiz like before. Uh, you can answer it by clicking on the correct answer um, in the tab uh, above the, where you type in your message. The, the following uh, the question is, all eating bacteria has been found throughout the water column up to 11,000 depths. True or false? So I can see that people are starting to answer the questions. Um, we have so far 90, ooh, 80, oh, it, <laughs> it varies. Um, more for, we have definitely more answers for the, for the first um, answer, true. And then for the second, false. Uh, around 80, 20. I give a couple, uh, some 30 seconds more, and then we'll comment on the results. Yeah, I think now we reached, uh, I think participants have, uh, most of them have answered. So we have 70% for true and 28% for um, false. Justina, do you want to uh, comment and explain? <laughs> yes, please. So uh, the answer is true. Um, so in uh, 2019, um, some research happening in the Marianas Trench, 
identified a, a huge population of um, uh, microbes, bacteria uh, that uh, could eat hydrocarbons, that can eat oil. Um, and which is quite, if you think about it, considering humans uh, can't go down that far in our cells, you have to send ROVs. It's quite incredible that bacteria can survive down there and thrive. And um, just on the side, this was one of the reasons why subsurface dispersant injection was actually um, considered and a really effective um, response strategy used in the Macondo oil spill because there was so much oil eating bacteria found in the water column uh, because there's a lot of naturally occurring oil seeps there. So uh, by using subsurface dispersant, um, they just utilized all this bacteria that sole aim is to eat oil and it does that very quickly and very efficiently. Thank you very much. I will end the poll for this first question and then display the second one. Um, so, um, these persons have the same ingredients in them as baby shampoo, soap and cleaning project, products. Is that true or false? So once again, you can answer um, the question by clicking on the correct answer uh, in the tab above where you type in your message in the chat box. Um, so for, in, for now, yeah, people are starting to answer. 95% for true, 4% for false. We'll wait a little bit and then comment on the results. Yeah, it's changing a bit, but most, a vast majority answered true, about, about 90%. Yeah, Justina, would you like to comment? <laughs> well, great. <laughs> that means that, that bit was clear. Um, yeah, it's uh, true. They do have the same ingredients as baby shampoo, soap, um, and a lot of uh, cleaning products have the same ingredients as, uh, well, surfactants, so the same ingredients as Corexit 9500. I mean, it's, it's an understandable um, uh, misconception to think that um, something, a, a chemical or a substance that's not used a lot and only used in, you know, times of anger is is toxic. And I do get it. But actually, uh, you know, research, research upon research has been done to show that the, the ingredients used in Corexin 9500 are pretty much used in lots of things and a lot of things that were actually put onto our skin itself. So, you know, I'm not saying that you should go start rubbing uh, dispersant on you, but in terms of toxicity, it's it's not as, as harsh as uh, it has been formally thought. Thank you very much, uh, Justina, for your presentation and answering and commenting on the poll. So now I end the poll and I give the floor to Feroza um, for the last uh, presentation on the case study of the South African National Dispersant Policy. Feroza, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, as mentioned before, my name is Feroza. I'm from the South African Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. And I'll be presenting on South Africa's dispersion policy. Um, the presentation is not very long, but it will go through uh, setting the scene as to uh, legislative-wise, how the dispersion policy fits in um, the country's legislation, and then a breakdown of what can be found in the policy um, and what and, and a bit more detail around the content of the policy. So just to say that South Africa has an established history of using um, dispersion policy as part of our all-school response uh, strategy. And um, the policy was given its power through regulations under the Prevention and Combating of Pollution of Sea by Oil Act, uh, specifically Chapter 7, which refers to the policy under our department. Um, <clears throat> this is, it has also gone through uh, a number of revision processes because, you know, technology and uh, changes over time and the more, the more we learn about the use of dispersants, 
means that how we approach using this person's changes and that needs to be reflected in the policy. So we're currently uh, busy with a third version of a policy for, for use of dispersants in the country. Um, and this version has significant changes, including reference to our department's um, uh, key piece of legislation, the National Environmental Management Act, just to give it a bit more um, power or, or um, relative, uh, relevance. Um, also that the draft that we currently, that I'm presenting today, was also sent externally for review to ITOP. So we try to key, to put in the most up-to-date uh, information and um, thoughts that go into decisions when it comes to using dispersants and capture that in the policy. So what is typically found in the policy? This is a table of contents. We have the purpose and introduction and then chapter two looks, as, looks at dispersants as a tool in the oil spill response toolkit and it basically covers um, why using dispersants, how, how they should be used, what are the advantages and disadvantages, um, and when and when they should be used and when they should not be used. So um, the information that has been presented to you by Justina and Ken would be found in this chapter. Um, this next chapter looks at dispersant testing and approval. Uh, apologies. <coughs> and this talks to um, the actual dispersant product um, and how it can be approved for use. Uh, it needs to meet certain standards and that is, that is described in this chapter. The next chapter looks at the response strategy and this is typically the approval process for using um, dispersants, how the authorities make that, that decision and also what are the restrictions for use of dispersants. Um, and then the rest of the chapters are pretty self-explanatory. Um, the, this, this version of the policy also has appendices which provides a bit more detail on the approval process for dispersant use and um, provides uh, your uh, templates for forms when it comes to applications and reporting. So when we talk about dispersant testing and approval, uh, Justina mentioned it briefly as well. In South Africa, we have a national standard that needs to be um, complied with in order for dispersants to be a dispersant product to be approved for use as a dispersant during an all-school response. And uh, the standard includes testing for toxicity and efficiency. Now, if a, you know our country has as a bit of a capacity issue and the policy does address this by allowing for the acceptance of certification from four countries, specifically France, UK, Australia and America, as the uh, approval process is very similar to ours. So when we talk about restrictions of use, this is typically in uh, also in this chapter on approval, uh, sorry, in, on, on strategies, uh, we have a, a restriction where dispersants can only be used in waters that are more than three nautical miles from the nearest body of land and at a depth of more than 20 meters. And that um, all of these, um, the use of these must be approved by our department um, and Uh, unless under exceptional circumstances, um, or even where pre-approval has been given. And I'll talk a bit more about pre-approval in the next slide. So the policy does provide a process for pre-approval, and this is specifically for fixed facilities that would require an all-school contingency plan, such as your offshore uh, platforms, um, facilities maybe like your ports, uh, Etc., and it's limited to tier one level spills. Um, and basically, it does, it requires that whoever's applying for pre approval um, goes through the process of NEBA um, and, and, and applies their mind with regards to 
whether this person is cost suitable for their circumstances. Also, with scenarios that they would be would be um, that they would outline in their plan as well, um, and the department would review the application and uh, determine whether it's suitable or not. And if so, it will be captured in their plan as as a pre-approval. Um, so we as a country do not prescribe um, sort of geographic pre-authorization. We look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's very specific to actual facilities. Then when we're talking about an actual incident where we would need to, uh, where approval would need to be given for the use of dispersants, we have updated our approval use, uh, excuse the slide, it is quite busy, but there is method to the madness here. Um, so what is different is that we've included a process for subsurface application of dispersants and an, a, a step by step approval process for that. And it's very specific to whether there is actually subsurface release of oil. And if so, then only will subsurface application of this person be considered. And obviously, NIBA, the principles of NIBA that has been um, explained to you by Ken and Justina will be applied here as well. And then just to uh, finish off, uh, what, what are the major updates in this current version of the policy is that we have tightened the geographic restrictions, as mentioned before, we have uh, within three nautical miles of land and 20 meter depths. It was a bit uh, more expensive before. Um, we have the addition of subsurface application of dispersants and NIBA is described in more detail. We've included process flow diagrams for approval of dispersant use. And we've also um, provided alternatives for the approval of dispersant products and also the inclusion of appendices for more detail on approval processes and the required forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Rosa, you. Uh, for your presentation. Very clear and for giving uh, us the presentation of the case study uh, of the South African uh, National uh, Dispersant Policy. I think it uh, is useful for everybody to see uh, how uh, a national uh, policy and uh, dispersant policy works. Um, now we will turn uh, to the Q&A session. So I've already seen uh, many questions in, in the chat. It is good. Um, I will um, read them out loud and, and the, uh, the presenters to answer to them. Um, so if you wish, you can turn on your video. Um, so first question, what is the recommended response strategy for large rainbow slash silver sheen at sea surface? Um, and then there is the precision instantaneous subsea release. Um, Ken? Uh, yes, so uh, for those who don't know, we, we can look at an oil spill uh, is appearance on the surface and classify the thickness. So there are five thicknesses in a thing called the Bond Agreement uh, colour code. Uh, and sheen rainbow are the two thinner layers. So she, silver sheen or rainbow sheen will be the thinner layers of a, of a, of a, of a slick, if you like. Um, there's actually not a lot of justification for responding to that depending on where this is if it's on the way offshore and you've got rainbow sheen or silver sheen you probably wouldn't match much of a response other than monitoring and evaluating if it's a thin sheen there's a very good chance that that's going to naturally evaporate or naturally burst over quite a short period of time so therefore there's no point in us mobilizing lots of response equipment or spraying dispersing chemicals onto that uh, on that particular type of incident so in that case unless it's near shore uh, we'll just leave 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 it alone uh, and keep an eye on it and, and hopefully it will naturally disperse or, or evaporate. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I have another question, uh, which is, is how does the sea waves affect the efficacy of the dispersants used? Um, does someone want to answer that? Yep, Ken, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that actually helps. We we want uh, more more action, more wave action, more sea movement. That helps the mixing motion, mixing application of the dispersant into the into the water column. So actually, the bigger the wave action, the the better really uh, for the dispersant um, efficacy. 
if it's extremely rough seas, in some cases, we may not actually apply dispersants because that rough sea might actually do the job for us. There are examples where that's happened. There's a large incident in the UK, uh, the Brea, a few years ago, spilled um, 80,000 cubic metres of oil into the sea. Uh, quite a light, light product, group two oil, and none of that was actually recovered. It all naturally evaporated or dispersed because the seas were so rough, it basically broke it open to those small uh, particles and allowed that uh, natural dispersion process to take place. So we didn't have to add chemicals in that place. So wave action can actually help us. The right oil and right wave action will actually uh, increase that natural dispersion. Okay, thank you very much, Ken. Um, another question is, are dispersants recommended for use on fresh water? If yes, what are the key considerations before use? Um, does anyone want to answer? Justina, maybe? Yeah. Um, so the type of dispersants that we use at sea, we wouldn't use in fresh water. Um, for, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think there is a type of dispersant that we could use in fresh water. But a neba SEMA discussion uh, research would be necessary because uh, fresh water might be a closed body. So there might not be the water exchange and dilution, which is necessary for good dispersant use um, for uh, dilution through the water column and toxicity. So it would be a uh, we'd need to think about that. And um, yeah, definitely the dispersant that we use at the sea, we wouldn't use in fresh water. Thank you, Justina. Ken, uh, we'd like to um, compliment. I'd, I'd agree with that. We have, there, there have been trials using dispersants in fresh water, but in, in back to that, there's um, not so much mixing action because water, fresh water generally is fairly stationary. Uh, certain large bodies where, you would, where you've got the depth of water that you want to supply dispersants are going to be quite stationary, so you're not going to get that mixing action. Um, so it's not something we would generally do. Having said that, every hospital is different, and I think it, it could be considered, uh, but unlikely. Thank you very much. And um, then I have a question for uh, Justina, I think. What type of bacteria then uh, are eating the oil? Uh, I think Justina may, um, we may have lost her. She doesn't move. <laughs> um, so I'll jump, uh, unless Ken, you would like to answer that question or Feroza? Uh, it was in Justina's presentation. So I think we can wait for her to reconnect. Okay. Yeah. Um, then uh, two questions. Um, what? Okay, this is also very precise and and technical. So maybe, um, um, what do you think about the use of other products that are used for the acceleration of bio biodegradation processes? MDC, MPCD, molecular potential chain disintegrator, or PP versus dispersant. That's what the first question. Um, oh, Justina, you your turn. <laughs> Sorry, I got kicked off there. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? And um, yeah, I will repeat the question. I think Feroz, I wanted to answer. Um, yeah, I think uh, just to take a stab at that, um, I, I think the, the person is referring to bioremediation products uh, specifically maybe. versus versus this persons. Um, there's the, there is a time and a place for the use of bioremediation products, but typically uh, dispersants are your immediate response um, tool. Um, uh, it's, it's meant for uh, a quick response. Uh, it's highly effective. And, and depending on the circumstances which are outlined by that Ken and Justina and our policy that we've, we've uh, developed outlines, um, you know, there are circumstances that are useful for dispersant use. Bioremediation is more long term um, and would be uh, more suitable for areas, specific areas that might not have as much exposure to people or um, any other factors or more isolated areas, so to speak. So there's, there are um, circumstances that are suitable for both types of products. Um, but when we're talking about an immediate response, dispersants would be a more practical um, uh, product. Thanks. Thank you very much, Feroza, for your answer. Um, uh, Justina, the answer was, um, what do you think about the 
the question was, what do you think about the use of other products that are used for acceleration of um, bioremediation? I think you're right, Feroza, that was the, the, the word that was meant. Processes um, such as MPCD or PP versus persons. So I don't know if you would like to <laughs> complement what Feroza said, but I think it was very clear. Yeah, I think she covered it. Okay, great. Um, the second question was, does the, appro uh, the approval of this person have to consider also the ecotoxicity evaluation of the oil? Of the product plus oil, sorry. Yes, I think that, uh, Justina, this is for you. You mentioned it in your presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yes, um, uh, ideally, yes, it would. It, um, so it would uh, look at uh, ecotox tests, which have happened in different labs um, and it would choose the one that's uh, at an appropriate level uh, that that regulator says yeah that's an appropriate level for us to use and um, so it's not just uh, you know the, the most common types of dispersants that we have um, or the most readily available I mean that comes into play because it's about resourcing and logistics but it is a lot to do with toxicity testing as well because the regulator needs to be confident, as you can see in the SA dispersant policy, with um, with their decision to allow dispersants to be sprayed. They need to be confident the fact that by spraying dispersants, the the nebosema is uh, just justifiable. It's going to um, minimise further harm to the environment or protect any more sensitivities. So yeah, it's included. Thank you very much. Um, we have two last questions. Uh, the first one is, what is the toxicity level that is required for bacteria eating the oil uh, not to be affected? That's an excellent question. And my answer is, I don't know. Um, but if whoever posed that question would like to leave their name in the comments, then um, I can um, find out and be in touch. So it's um, Shibujan uh, Akafa. So yeah, if you would like to um, drop us an email, uh, <laughs> please do not hesitate. We'll try to find the answer to that question. Um, then other question, uh, will the latest uh, South African the dispersion policy be made publicly available? Faraza? Um, it's Yes, it's currently in the draft version. Um, once it's been finalized and uh, approved uh, by our authority, by our gates of authorities, then it will be made freely available um, and yeah, readily accessible online. Thank you. Uh, oops, sorry, I said it was two last questions, but one uh, other question came up and we still have two minutes to answer it. So um, what's the difference between bioremediation uh sorry what's the difference between bioremediation and microorganism okay um okay I'll, I'll take this one okay so there there are a um type of dispersants that we call biodispersants um and uh these dispersants um are several uh, additions to it. So um, they uh, are biodegradable, which is actually not um, significant because all dispersants are biodegradable. Um, or um, instead of using perhaps dispersants, there's the um, suggestion that you can insert, uh, add microbes to the oil spill. So um, there's obviously the naturally occurring bacteria and microbes that happen in the water column, but the, the biodispersant type would be spraying or adding or releasing more microbes to the water column, which will uh, mean that there's more things to eat the oil and it should degrade the oil more quickly. Uh, the problem is with that um, is that these bacteria that are introduced just get eaten by the naturally occurring bacteria because they're not suited to that environment. And um, so I'm thinking that might be the link between the bioremediation and uh, the dispersants um, because uh, yeah, bioremediation you're using or introducing new um, organic uh, components into it to help the bioremediation and then the biodispersants you're using or trying to introduce more bacteria. But like I said, it, they don't tend to be that successful because the naturally occurring bacteria just eat them and the oil. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your answer. A last one, because it's very quick and we still have one minute, is do these persons have an expiring date? 
<laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Uh, dispersants don't necessarily uh, an expiry date as long as they're kept in the correct condition. So as long as they're kept out of direct UV light, kept within a, a temperature range, quite a broad temperature range, but kept within a certain temperature range, um, and kept in sealed containers, they will they have, they don't have a, a an expiry date as such. Having said that, we do still test them periodically just to make sure they are maintaining their efficacy. And what does actually have an expiry date quite often is the containers they're kept in. So what we might have to do every so many years is rotate the containers out and change the containers, but we keep the dispersant, which is a little bit back to front, but that's uh, that's what we do for dispersants. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much all for uh, your presentations and to uh, for your answer to the questions um, and for all the participants to have attended this uh, webinar. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. You can find the replay, you will find the replay of this webinar on our website. Um, and YouTube page, um, and there will be a next webinar on wildlife response um, mid-July. Um, so thank you very much uh, once again to our, uh, our um, presenters and participants, and we hope to see you uh, very soon in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good.